All right. So let's dive in back where we left off. Um, I wanted to get through nitrogen uh, last time. I didn't quite make it. I got pretty close. Um, we were talking about Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch and the uh, first industrial uh, production of nitrogen, which is an essential element to all protein and uh, nucleic acids. Um, and nitrogen is 78% of the environment around us, right? So um, this guy, Fritz uh, Haber, had the sort of uh, lightning strike in his uh, mind by noticing that lightning itself uh, fixes nitrogen. Um, and uh, he and this guy Carl Bosch developed uh, a process for doing that. And this basically uh, revolutionized uh, the way we uh, conduct agriculture in the country. Um, and you can see that light blue line on um, sort of the uh, third from the top along the, on the right there, that squiggly one. That represents uh, all of the uh, artificial... Uh, nitrogen that has been fixed via Haber-Bosch, and that is the main driver of the pink line, which is the total reactive nitrogen, or when they say reactive, it means uh, nitrogen that is able to be taken up by plants in, in some form or another, okay? Um, and uh, this uh, fixation of nitrogen has um, driven the global population explosion. Uh, all right. So I had this statistic down there. In 1918, Germany was generating over 200 uh, ton, 200,000 tons of synthetic ammonia per year for use in fertilizers and explosives. So only five years after this chemical process was developed, they were making 200,000 tons of synthetic ammonia. Think about that. Uh, this is just from gas that they're pulling out of the atmosphere. Um, it's a pretty remarkable uh, transformation that happened in, in a very short period of time. All right. So here's the reaction that's ac ac uh, actually happening. Uh, you're having N2 gas, uh, the two nitrogens that are coupled by uh, three uh, bonds, the, the triple bond, the high energy unreactive bond. Nitrogen itself is, is fairly inert. Um, and combining it with three molar equivalents, three equivalents of hydrogen gas, uh, H2 gas. And then ex uh, exposing it to extreme heat and pressure and out pops uh, two equivalents of ammonia, um, ammonia gas, anhydrous ammonia. So uh, on the right-hand side, you see a picture of Fritz Haber's uh, first industrial uh, scale uh, reaction vessel for doing this. And they would uh, pat, fill the chamber full of gas uh, and then pass uh, high, you know, high pressure gas. And then they would uh, put an extremely high uh, voltage through that chamber. Uh, that one dates to 1921, uh, so just after uh, World War II, or World War I, pardon me. Um, we'll talk about Fritz Haber a little bit uh, at the end of the class um, when we talk about the podcasts. Uh, I'm assuming everybody listened to that and hopefully found that a little bit interesting about this guy's story, uh, what drove him. Yeah. The arrow represents um, the, the uh, chemical transformation. So heat and pressure is implied in whatever that transformation is. That that's just uh, that's showing that the arrow, the, the direction of the reaction, is what that is. Yeah. So y you have nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas, and they're going to react, and then they lead to uh, this ammonium. That's that's the basic uh, convention in a uh, chemical reaction. And that that all that. Symbology on the, on the bottom, uh, the delta H is just uh, the heat of reaction 
that's uh, the, the enthalpy is what it's called, uh, the change in enthalpy that uh, happens by this reaction. Um, so they're putting a significant amount of energy into it, uh, 45 kilojoules per mole, uh, per mole of uh, nitrogen. And there's two moles of nitrogen, so it's about 96 uh, kilojoules uh, per mole of uh, elemental nitrogen gas. All right. So this has dumped a huge amount of nitrogen into the environment, much more than uh, is able to be put into the environment by the natural processes. So when I was showing you uh, last time the nitrogen cycle, I talked about the four ways that it gets there. It can get there by uh, a bacterial process um, uh, with on root nodules. It can get there from a small amount of it gets through excrement uh, and decomposition, and then there is um, lightning and artificial sources, right, um, from, from the Haber-Bosch process. So all of those other processes uh, were quickly dwarfed by the human capacity for, for fixing nitrogen, and <clears throat> um, this is, has had deleterious effects. So one of them is on our drinking water. Um, Uh, so there are 15, what is that, uh, 15 teragrams, 15 teragrams, if you can wrap your head around a, what a, even a, a teragram is, um, a terabyte, so tera is uh, 1 billion, uh, fifth, so that's 15 billion grams of nitrogen per year end up in our uh, groundwater. That's an enormous amount of nitrogen. Um, and, these are, and those are from anthropogenic sources. Um, it's particularly prevalent in areas with uh, really shallow groundwater that have a lot of um, agriculture. So in, in particular, places like Nebraska, um, Iowa, the, the bread belt are really, uh, the, grain, the grain belt uh, are in the plain states are particularly susceptible to this. So uh, the estimate is that at least one and a half million Americans, one and a half million Americans, uh, drink water contaminated uh, with nitrate of some sort. Um, why is this a problem? It leads to uh, methemoglobinemia, is how you say that. Say it fast uh, five times, I dare you. Uh, otherwise known as blue baby syndrome. So... Um, Talk about blue baby syndrome. Normally, uh, you see we have in the red box there a uh, red blood cell that's full of hemoglobin. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later when we talk about iron, uh, exactly what hemoglobin looks like. But um, iron binds uh, oxygen, and it transports oxygen from your lungs to the tissues in your body. That's how our lungs work. That's uh, when we breathe in. That's what we're doing. We're trying to get oxygen to the uh, lungs, so it can exchange uh, into the blood and be carried by the iron in our hemoglobin. However, when uh, nitrate binds to, uh, it, it also happily binds, um, and in, in fact what it does is oxidizes the, uh, it changes the oxidation state of the iron from an Fe2 plus to an Fe3 plus. And when this happens, uh, the iron does not want to bind oxygen any longer. It will not bind oxygen. Um, and so we have uh, also a color change in the iron. The iron is what gives your blood its red color. The Fe2 plus oxidation state is what gives your blood a, a red color. And when uh, its oxidation state is changed by the presence of uh, nitrate, which is an oxidizing agent, um, it can no longer transport oxygen. And we get this um, blue baby syndrome. So uh, it's, children are particularly sens uh, sensitive to it because they're just smaller. They're smaller. There's less, uh, oxi there's less pardon me, uh, hemoglobin in their body. Uh, they're very susceptible to it. So uh, these babies um, who uh, fall prey to blue baby syndrome um, can have uh, cognitive and developmental uh, defects that result from it. Uh, and they become cyanotic or uh, 
or blue. They have a, a blue tinge to their lips, to their skin. Um, they're, they're not happy. Um, and even in uh, low levels, uh, where it doesn't uh, produce this uh, dramatic effect, um, you can have an increased risk of birth defects and cancer uh, in everyday people, not just children, just normal adults uh, who are drinking this nitrate. So um, there are genuine impacts on human health from having so much of this nitrate get into our uh, into the uh, food system, the groundwater, and uh, work its way into our human biology. All right. Um, so here's a map of areas that are uh, presumably at risk of uh, nitrate contamination uh, due to shallow groundwater. Uh, Maine's doing pretty well uh, up here. And does anyone want to guess why that is? <clears throat> I'll give you another statistic. Yeah, Kristen. Is it because um, I'm also noticing it's lower out towards the Rockies because we're higher above sea level? Uh, we are uh, higher above sea level, that's right, uh, and that does have some indirect consequences to this. That's a good observation, so you don't see it along the Rockies uh, too much. You certainly don't see it very much in Maine or along the rest of the Appalachian Trail. Um, there's a reason for that. Yeah. Is it because the kind of like up on the trees? Thank you. Exactly. That's it. exactly it. Maine is, uh, has the highest percentage of its... Uh, land area covered by forest. And because of that, we don't really use a lot of uh, nitrates or artificial nitrogen fertilizer on the land here. Um, but uh, the areas that are more agriculturally intense, like the, the grain belt there across the entire Midwest, um, those uh, parts of uh, the country are very susceptible, and, and often their groundwater is quite shallow there. Um, here in Maine and in places where there are mountains, you have to uh, oftentimes drill really deep through some rock to get into some uh, a, a proper aquifer. Um, so because of that, uh, we tend to have uh, less of a problem with this. But as you can see, in, in Nebraska, um, it's, it's pretty acute. Yeah. Great question. Great question. Uh, you know, I would say probably the first thing would be to think of different ways of um, to think of different ways of um, fertilizing our crops. Different ways of using using the fertilizer uh, on our crops. So you know, I don't want to stray too far into a policy uh, class, but uh, you've probably taken uh, food policy with Travis. What did he did he talk about this ever? Yeah, okay. Well, <clears throat> one of the policies that, um, one of the things that fertilizer companies tend to do, like Cargill or Monsanto or whatever, wherever you're buying this stuff, um, they in the fall, they are trying to clear out their stock, right? Uh, they have a lot of uh, fertilizer. So they put it on sale really cheap. And they tell these farmers, look, here's a bunch of fertilizer, extra, extra cheap. Buy it, put it on your land in the fall when they don't need it. Your plant, your, you know, but it can't hurt. Uh, just apply it so you get a, a jump on the spring. Then the snowpack comes down and it washes, uh, it dissolves all that nitrate. So they just chucked it right into the watershed. Is is what is what they did. It's, there are market driven problems that um, are underlying this um, that that could be rectified. So uh, if we're committed to artificial fertilizer and, and if we're committed to having 8 billion people on the planet, then we are committed to artificial fertilizer. Um, there has to be, uh, to solve the problem, one of the ways would be to look at uh, getting better about um, matching up uh, supply and demand. Uh, so, that, you know, because uh, some of these fertilizer companies are taking advantage of inefficiencies in that. I mean, that's kind of what finance is, right? Um, so I don't have the, all the solutions, but um, yeah, I think, I think recognizing the in, indirect costs of that kind of behavior and holding uh, those suppliers responsible for carrying the burden of that uh, would probably change the behavior.
and and I don't know. I, I tend to be in favor of uh, regulation. Um, not everybody is, but you know, that's me. Uh, other ways of dealing with it. So you're thinking more scientifically, like how can we uh, filter out the nitrate, for example, or other ways of, um, yeah, you're talking about a massive infrastructural investment in city water systems. I mean, look at Flint and like, you know, probably a ton of other municipalities across the country that are time bombs that we don't know about uh, who don't really have the, the money to deal with the fundamental crumbling infrastructure that we have. Uh, right now in terms of uh, water treatment and like just water uh, dispersal, you know, city water. Um, so, but uh, bottled water isn't the solution. Uh, not, it's not a long-term solution either. So, I don't know. It's, it's a real problem. It's a real problem, you know. Great opportunity. Build a life around it. Good. It could be you. It could be all of us. It's going to have to be all of us. All right, so that's nitrogen, forever cycling from air to soil, roots, crops, us, exercise addict. <clears throat> All right, so um, we'll put Daniel Rutherford up there with a green box around nitrogen as we walk across this periodic table. Now to the, um, on, we're going to move next to phosphorus. I talked about how CNP, that red field ratio, was, were kind of identified as the three most important elements, uh, right? Uh, and we, we dealt with nitrogen. I want to see how far we can get through phosphorus today. It's a really interesting story. Uh, the story of phosphorus uh, goes back to this guy, Hennig Brandt. Um, and so this fella was a uh, alchemist who was also a uroscopist. He was just trying to make a life back in the Middle Ages, right, in the, in the uh, 17th century, trying to make a life. And um, uroscopy is a um, discipline that goes back to uh, Hippocrates, the Greek, all right? And Hippocrates... Uh, in whatever, the 4th century or, or what have you, uh, he would have someone pee in a, in a jar, and he, in a glass, and he would look at it and smell it, see the bubbles, you know, take a sip, uh, see what it tasted like, whatever. Um, and he, he's shaking his head, no, not me. I'm not a Eurospivist. Me neither. Sounds weird. But, uh, you know, this is what people did. This was early science. And so... And they, they would try to determine disease from this and, you know, to a greater or lesser effect. And this guy was one of those people. Um, and he was also looking for the philosopher's stone, as a lot of uh, alchemists were. What is the philosopher's stone? Any, any Harry Potter fans in here? Any of you guys grow up with Harry Potter? Yep. What was the philosopher's stone? Um, it was, I don't know what, like, how much history and the book was really the same, but like it was said whoever had it would like live forever. Yeah, exactly. So the Philosopher's Stone was a, um, a mystical, mythical material compound that um, had been described in some obscure texts and these middle-aged guys were uh, obsessed with finding it so they could live forever. They also thought that it could turn baser elements such as lead into gold. They wanted to live forever and have all the money. That's what they wanted. That's what these philosophers were trying to do. Who doesn't still want that? I don't. But he was after it. And um, he needed a really big lab to do it. So he burned through his money. The, the uroscopy business wasn't really giving him the money that he needed. Uh, so what did he do? He married money. He married a very rich and very old uh, woman who uh, promptly and mysteriously died. Um, and he built part of his lab and continued his studies, but that wasn't enough. And so he married another very rich and very old uh, woman who also died. Well, now he's got all this money, 
and he builds an exceptional lab, and he also has a couple stepsons who uh, he is training in the family business of uroscopy, and he sends them out to the local taverns and gets them to collect uh, pee. He gets them to collect huge amounts of urine. has all these uh, drunk bar patrons pissing in uh, containers, and he brings it home, which is not like outside of what he was normally doing as a uroscopist. Well, he took a lot of this stuff. He took 1,500 gallons. That's 1,500 gallons of urine collected from uh, these beer-drinking tavern goers and would then allow it to putrefy and rot in his basement lab uh, for an exceptional amount of time for a few weeks or a month until it really smelled ripe to him. And then, just to make it even better, he started boiling it down. Um, and Sorry, hold on. We're, we're going for it. He would boil this down and uh, until the urine became a thick golden syrup. Um, and, and then uh, he then would put it under extreme heat until these red oil. So this is his recipe. We could maybe go and do this in the lab uh, sometime here. Um, <laughs> heat until a red oil distills up from it and draw that off. Allow the remainder to cool where it consists of a black, spongy upper part and a salty lower part. Uh, discard the salt, which turns out to have been a mistake, um, and mix the red oil, uh, which is red phosphorus. Any of you guys uh, watch Breaking Bad? They talk about it in there. Uh, didn't use urine, though. Anyways, they, they stir the red oil back into the black, uh, the carbon, and they heat that strongly for 16 hours. First, some white fumes start coming up. And this guy's getting in deep at this point. And then an oil, a white waxy uh, oil uh, comes out, which glows in the dark. He got this glow-in-the-dark paste out of uh, phosphorus. And you can imagine that he knew he was on the right path. He was close to the Philosopher's Stone at this point, or at least some kidney stones. All right. So um, what was going on here? Urine contains sodium phosphate and a whole bunch of organics like urea and whatever. I think I showed you some of them when we were, uh, may, no, I just showed you urea and maybe uric acid a different time. Uh, some of the components, uh, organic components of urine. We'll talk about P more later. But uh, this is the reaction. The, the phosphate, the anionic phosphate, reacted with the carbon, um, the charcoal left over from the burning of these different carbon compounds. <clears throat> Whoa, that's going to be a spike on the recording there. Um, and... Uh, gave him carbon dioxide, which was the fumes that were, were blowing off, and um, gaseous phosphorus, which was bubbling through the water, cooling down, and then condensing into this uh, white waxy, uh, into this white waxy stuff. So the salt that he discarded uh, previously was actually most of the phosphate. Uh, he could have gotten a lot more phosphate out of this reaction if he had uh, tried to uh, react that salt along with the carbon. Anyways, he got um, out of 5,500 liters, the 1,500 gallons of urine, he got 120 grams of phosphorus. That's like a box of paper clips, like out of a room, like this size room full of urine. Uh, he boiled it down and, and got a, uh, yeah, you missed the, the, the stinky urine part, but he got a box of paper clips out, out of, of phosphorus out of it. However, uh, so I did the calculation here, one liter of urine contains 1.4 grams of phosphorus salts, 
or 0.11 grams of pure white phosphorus. So instead, um, he could have gotten uh, five boxes of paper clips instead of one if he had kept those salts. Um, anyways, he never knew that, though. Yeah, Nick? No, the alcohol, there probably wasn't a lot of alcohol in the urine unless the, um, they were super, super drunk and in partial kidney failure and, and liver cirrhosis, which probably describes some of it, but alcohol probably would have quickly boiled off. It would have quickly volatilized with um, all the water that he was, in fact, it would have came off before, and there would have been, an, I'm imagining, a very negligible amount. Um, so... Yeah, alcohol wasn't probably a big co component. And anyways, alcohol is just carbon uh, and oxygen and hydrogen, so that would have uh, that would have just ended up as the the carbon, uh, the char that was left behind. All right, so this guy still trying to pay his bills, never found the philosopher's stone. He sold the recipe for uh, two hundred sailors which was a German coin. He got 200 coins for this recipe that he had come up with. Uh, there's an example of it. And the recipe sort of did the rounds of uh, the other scientific weirdos of the time. Uh, enter this guy, Robert Boyle, um, who repeated the experiment. A lot of people started boiling pee down. Um, and uh, Robert Boyle was one of them. Uh, interestingly, he uh, was the first to invent matches. And so phosphorus can be used uh, is one of the components um, in ex various kinds of explosives. Uh, white phosphorus uh, is, it can be quite reactive. And so this guy, Robert Boyle, the same guy who came up with Boyle's Law. You may remember uh, Boyle's Law from high school when you were talking about the ideal gas law and the relationships between Pivnert, uh, pressure and volume equals uh, number of molecules and temperature. Uh, well, phosphorus turns out to have been the thir 13th element that was discovered. And because it was used to make matches, it was then called the devil's element. The devil's element. Um, <clears throat> Hennig Brandt, the guy from the, 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 the original pea boiler, he named his stuff phosphorus um, after the Greek god, uh, the morning star. The, uh, the Greek myth is about um, these two brothers, the morning star, which appeared uh, just as the sun was coming up, and uh, his uh, brother Hesperus, Phosphorus and Hesperus, uh, was the evening star. At a certain point, the Greeks uh, realized that they were the same, and the morning star and the evening star were both just the planet Venus, so they dedicated the planet to Venus, um, and, uh, but the Greek word for Venus was, uh, phosphorus. And so this is, and, and phosphorus, the glowing light of the morning and the evening. Uh, this is why Brandt named phosphorus what he did. Uh, the first time that phosphorus went into commercial production was this guy down here, Gottfried Hankwitz, uh, who lived a little bit later, a little bit later in the 18th century, early 18th century. He was Boyle's lab assistant. And uh, he came up with various, in, uh, com well, I won't say industrial, but he sort of uh, ramped up the production of phosphorus so people could use it for different things after they discovered its utility in making things such as matches. All right. So phosphorus, it's essential element for all life. And we're gonna, that's going to be a theme we're going to come back to uh, several times over the next uh, several lectures. We find it in nucleic acids. We find it in uh, phospholipids, bones, teeth. Uh, it's also a part of uh, adenosine triphosphate. So here on the uh, right-hand side, you see a little portion of DNA and the phosphodiester backbone, what's called the phosphodiester backbone uh, of DNA. On the, to the right are the bases uh, that match up in DNA, and then the left is this backbone. It's sort of the long legs of the ladder that you uh, have seen when you see DNA. Uh, and it's made of phosphate. Um, ATP is, is uh, one of the, 
so AMP is one of the uh, nucleotides that's in DNA, but we put two more phosphate groups on it, and it becomes the fundamental uh, currency of energy in our cells. We'll talk about that in, in much more detail when I talk about central metabolism in the cell and how uh, we make energy and how the food uh, that we eat helps that to happen. All right, so it is essential for life. Um, now, before we move on, I want to I wanna get to this guy here, Justi, uh, Justus von Liebig, uh, who lived in the 19th century. So this guy uh, came to realize um, the law of the minimum. Uh, and he understood that phosphorus was essential to life and, and agriculture, but he had this law of the minimum. And, and that says that, I'll quote, if one of the nutritive elements is deficient or lacking, growth will be poor even when all the other elements are abundant. And um, the metaphor that he used was imagine a barrel. All right, you're a barrel maker. What do they call those? I forget what a barrel maker is called. But you're making a barrel and you put all the staves in the barrel and you haven't cut them off uh, even across the top yet. You've just banded them together. <laughs> and you fill the barrel to see if it's going to hold water. Um, the barrel only fills as high as the shortest stave, all right, as the shortest uh, plank in the barrel. Uh, and this was his notion of uh, essential nutrients when you're growing something, when you're growing food, that there is a limiting uh, nutrient. There's a limiting nutrient. The law of Liebig's law of the minimum. Uh, does it actually work? Well, most of the time, in fact, it does. Um, and phosphorus and nitrogen are the most usual suspects. They are, uh, it's either one or the other, are the two primary things that limit production. Uh, there's a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. Plants are able to get it. We'll talk about that much more when we get to carbon, uh, hopefully early next week. Um, it, Liebig's law of the minimum breaks down sort of when you recognize that sometimes phosphorus and nitrogen can be co-limiting. They can be co-limiting when the staves are the same height, uh, for example. All right. So, um, and sometimes you can have micronutrients such as potassium, molybdenum, silicon, iron, etc. That can be uh, the limiting reagents uh, occasionally. Occasionally. Uh, plants do need some of those trace elements uh, that we identified on the periodic table. Uh, but usually it's, it's uh, phosphorus or nitrogen. All right. The phosphorus cycle. Why don't we, why don't we, um, well, I can talk about the phosphorus cycle for a couple minutes. And then we'll, we'll switch gears. So, phosphorus, it's extremely, exceptionally slow. So I, so I showed you the nitrogen cycle, right? It's pretty quickly cycling through the air, down into the soil, and then back up uh, through de denitrification. I didn't talk about that much. The phosphorus cycle is not like that. It's not like that at all. And this is an important concept because um, phosphorus does not have any um, biologically relevant gaseous forms. It doesn't form gases that are floating out in the atmosphere that have any impact on the, the biological cycle. All right. So because of that, uh, phos uh, phosphorus is completely um, limited to terrestrial and aquatic sources, terrestrial and aquatic cycling. All right? it, doesn't, it doesn't volatilize into the air. It doesn't go up into the air uh, like nitrogen does, which is convenient because uh, nitrogen can cycle quickly because of that. So um, phosphate, the bulk of global phosphate is in rocks. And in fact, it's an extremely small component of rocks. Only about a tenth of a percent of the rocks out there uh, have phosphorus in them or only about a tenth of the per a percent of that rock uh, is made up of phosphorus, pardon me. So um, it is vast. There is a lot out there, but it's extremely dilute and exceptionally hard to extract. Um, so in 2017, 
the United States Geological Survey estimated that there were about 68 billion tons of uh, phosphorus in the world, um, reserved in, in the mountains and rocks and the bedrock going down to the crust. However, uh, about a quarter of a billion tons were mined in 2016, and that's, that's a lot, okay? So here, here's the actual phosphorus cycle. You have, how does it work? How does it cycle? We have phosphate rocks that are uh, mountains are slowly rising, rising, being pushed up. Rain falls on them and erodes the rock and watches a little bit of that phosphorus, that phosphate, the oxidized phosphorus, uh, down into the lakes and onto the land. Uh, it gets dissolved in there and uh, can be taken up by biology at that point. And then it also sediments down into uh, the bottom and uh, gets compacted and then uh, slowly goes through the cycle again, gets pushed back up. Um, there is uh, a fast cycle too. There's a slow and a fast cycle. We'll talk about this in the next slide. Uh, that will, this will be my last slide for today, but uh, the, the slides on, on Monday, we'll, we'll talk about the slow, fast and slow cycles. But the, the, the slow cycle is this thing with the mountain and the slow erosion of a mountain and, and the rise of a mountain. The fast cycle um, involves uh, crops, animals eating crops and then dying and just cycling through uh, the soil like that, uh, kind of a, a tight, faster cycle. Um, humans have been throwing this off by uh, mining phosphorus, mining phosphorus. Uh, and phosphorus mines are pretty gnarly looking things. Um, so let's see here. I'm gonna. I am gonna actually flash forward a little bit. Those are the fast and slow cycles. But for example, well, here's uh, Nauru. Here's Nauru, the um, island that it talked about in that podcast. Um, so somebody asked, yeah, look at that. So there's the like little ring of trees on the outside of uh, the island. If you were coming up to it in a boat, you're like, oh, this looks pretty good. This looks all right. And then you go in 100 yards, and next thing you know, you are in this wasteland, a total wasteland uh, that has been strip mined of all of the phosphorus that was on the surface of this uh, island uh, that had been deposited over uh, years and years and years. And so um, the, the point here is that Phosphorus mining, um, or not even phosphorus mining, but the, the necessity of phosphorus to grow plants can have really profound uh, implications uh, on all different parts of our lives. It can be environmental destruction. In that podcast you listened to, uh, I talked about uh, the social implications, the economic implications. Um, yeah. So... The chemistry of the food you eat uh, is vast in its effect on all the other uh, spheres of your life. All right. So with that, um, what did you guys uh, – I'm, I'm tempted to give you guys uh, a couple questions over the podcast or we could just talk about it. I kind of want to just talk about it, but um, – if I don't do the quiz now, we won't ever do it, will we? Yeah, ask me a question. Um, so, like, okay, I know, I know that you said that the kind of like the parts of the ocean are not like the highest atmosphere, and you can do kind of things that you have to destroy the world. Mm -hmm. Possibly. Yeah. But like, can you just like walk us through again, like how? Yeah, yeah, they had a they had a company like do that. How like how would you be able to like because I know that you said that it's such a finite like amount and like you don't need I guess anything mm -hmm. like it's pretty much just like anything but uh, like is it in rocks though? It's in rocks. This was actually um, if if you listen closely to that podcast, it it talked about uh, Nauru being an incredibly isolated spot in the middle of nowhere. Um, and uh, it was a stopping point for birds, and so it was actually guano that they were pulling off the uh, top of that island. It was like 
immense amounts of bird shit that had formed in the substrate uh, for the island's vegetation. And then they basically cleared that off. They're like, wow, this stuff is great. And then they started digging it up. Um, yeah, listen to that story. It talks, uh, it, there, it talks about a lot of things in that one podcast, but it, it focuses uh, for, for maybe about 10 minutes on the phosphorus um, and the impacts that that had and, and, the, and the chemistry behind it. Um, take out, whip out some pencils. Let's just do pencil and paper, and I'll, I'll, I'm just going to have you answer a, a question or two. Um, all right. So... All right, a couple questions. One over each of the podcasts. Describe the basic purpose and rationale behind Maine's new food sovereignty law. What are the potential drawbacks? Um, so this is a good thing to understand. You're going to be going to the Common Grounds Fair. This would be a great topic for conversation with one of those farmers, uh, some of those farmers out there. What do they think about Maine's new food sovereignty law? I'm sure you'll get lots of strong opinions. Why, did, why does it exist? Why did they do it? And wh what is it? And does it have any drawbacks? What are the drawbacks? <laughs> 